The Greater Ewan Nation, it, it covers from pretty much Bundina in the south of Sydney, all the way down to the Victorian border. And I believe it's, it's the most special place on earth. There's not many people who can say that my ancestors have been here for more than 60,000 years. We speak and sing our language, our songs. We speak it and sing it into the land and we put that energy into the land. My country is my mother. We come from the land. We will return to the land. A lot of people these days talk about rights and how much they have rights. But Aboriginal people, we think about the country and our obligations. We have an obligation to look after our land, to make sure that it's cared for and, and protected and, and there for future generations. My name is Uncle Bunja Smith. I am identify as and I'm recognised as a Walbunga elder. Our territory basically covers from Ulladulla to Naruma and we're a part of the Greater Ewan Nation. Our culture is based on relationships. It's relationships to each other and it's relationships to the country, its relationship to the birds and to the animals. It's all part of a really important circle. My name is Iris White. On my grandfather's side, our traditional lands are firmly planted here at Maruya, but our footprint extends up and down the coast, up into my grandmother's country, the Narigo people up in the snowy mountains. My name's Vicky Parsley. I identify as a Ewan Walbunja Murramurang Wiradjuri woman. I'm from the south coast, but my grandmother's family were from here at Batemans Bay and my grandfather's family was from Wallaga Lake. Our dreaming is entrenched in this landscape. There are stories that have been passed on through my family that give me my connection here. Oh, it means a lot to me. This is where all my family came from. Yeah, my um, mother was born here. My grandmother lived here and uh, Yes, all of, just where all the family came from, here, right where we are standing from this area. I feel like as if I'm home, yeah. My name is Doris Moore. I'm from Maruya, and my tribe is Walbunja. I have a strong connection to country through stories that have been handed down particularly our dreaming stories. They're all associated with significant events. I have a strong connection to country through the different kinds of labour that Aboriginal people did around here. And I honestly believe that our ancestor spirits still walk among us and guide us. And I feel incredibly proud to belong to the people of this country.
My name's Patricia Ann Ellis. I'm from Maria. I belong to the Bringji Yuan people, but I also have kin ties with the Walbunja people on the northern side of Maria River. I take strength from my culture and I walk proudly down that dream and track to keep that alive and striving for who we are and our deep connections for the land we live on, the mountains, the lake and the sea and the importance to tell that story of our animals. My name's Alison Walker. My home is Walliga Lake. Me tribe is Umbara the Black Duck, Yurinjan. So this place to me is a huge connection to my identity and who I am as an Indigenous man. Because as a young man, I'm 26 years old, I, I didn't really see much of the, the old days, if you want to call it. Um, so I live that through stories and, and so this place, I've heard a lot of stories about and, and has a lot of meaning to my family. So um, it's, it's great to be here and, and, and I love coming here. I, I, I bring my family down here and go fishing and, and diving here. Wallawan and Indiwan, Ba Jamaga Yurubini, Nayaga Jordan Nai, Wabunja Yuan Grunji. Jamaga Bungalaga, Nayaga Kerry Boyenga. I am a proud Brinji Yuan woman with Wabunja ties and kinship ties to the Dungari people up north. Meaning of country to me is where I belong and I belong here. I'm a saltwater person. I belong near the river. Being in your country is being like being at home. So you feel comfortable there. Um, you feel proud that it's your country. And looking after it means handing it down, making the young kids, the younger generations coming through feel proud of it and take ownership of it so that it is always protected. Dad. Most of the landscape is deeply connected with storylines and also ceremony. It's interesting because most of those places are very obvious in the land and they were some of the first noticeable land landmarks that Cook noticed when he was sailing past. One of my ancestors, a man by the name of James Walker, was the son of Tanungrabrim king of the Maruya Aboriginal people and he must have seen many a strange sight um, in his years because he had seen the first ship sail up the east coast as a nine-year-old boy. Through the education system I learned that Captain Cook travelled up the east coast of Australia and discovered Australia. What you've got to remember is that uh, Cook actually didn't land here. He sailed past, he did a cruise, he did a drive-by, I guess, in gangster style. He, he did a drive-by uh, in his boat. You know, I had a conversation with my class the other day because we talked about Captain Cook going up the coast and what do you imagine he would have seen? Shut your eyes, imagine there's no buildings, roads, cars, whatever. Imagine Captain Cook sailing past. What would Captain Cook have seen? And they're like, well, they would have seen angry Aboriginal people. You know, they would have. Actually, I heard about Cook in school. It's the only place I heard about him. And it got me to thinking how my ancestors thought about seeing this thing sailing past and thinking it's a cloud with the sails. And I said, okay, so now what do you think the Aboriginal people saw? 
And we talked about them being, you know, this alien sort of thing. They thought they were spirits and that sort of stuff. Our mob were seafaring people, but to see something of the size of those ships and the sails on those ships, you know, I, from what I can tell from the stories, I think it was the sails that frightened people. And not having any idea what it might be and never seeing anything like it, their imaginations got the hold of them and they believed that it was something like a giant hawk that was coming upon them and everybody flew inland. No tools, no weapons, no food. They just all picked up their babies and just took off. The mob were up on the mountain there and, and sending off fire and smoke and, um, and we thought it was a big pelican coming to eat all our mob and and take, take all our, our food and, 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 and gobble us all up. And they hid in the Stony Creek around Coiler for what seemed to be days. It took some time before they realised that they weren't being pursued by this giant bird. And they slowly came back onto the coast and there was no boats around. Whatever it was had clearly gone. There was no threat anymore. But they walked down onto the beach and when they got to the beach, they actually saw where some kind of watercraft had been pulled up onto the beach, like the keel of a boat, not knowing what it was, but they knew that it was a watercraft. And they also saw all these footprints. And some of the footprints had toes, but most of them didn't. So that then started their fear all over again because they didn't know what manner of creature had landed on the beach. And so we, we, we sent all these smoke signals out, out and, and, and we got the, the old fellas from down, down Badala Way and they, they, they went out to Potato Point and, um, and sung up Kurukurai, the wind spirit, and, and, and pushed a westerly, sent a westerly wind out to that garden gooba, that, that pelican, and, and pushed him out right out into the ocean. And, and it's even recorded in his journal that, that he was pushed out by a westerly wind um, right out to the ocean, and which which made him change his course. So he, he took off, and went north. Each time he went north, he seen on all these headlands. And when we talk about these headlands, they're really important places. A lot of our burials are there. Yeah. Um, a lot of our ceremonial grounds are there. Because we we greet that grandfather, the son. We greet grandmother Moon when she comes up. My name's Warren Foster, senior. I'm from Wallaga Lake here, and I'm a traditional Yuan Jurangange man. Mm. Well, the effect of Captain Cook arriving um, had a big impact on us, like Yuan people, because so like we were the first contact, like we were first seen him. He really impacted us culturally and spiritually as well. And I guess you know it's it's funny to to hear that story because I feel like we we did get gobbled up in a sense. Our land's been stolen. You know it. We all know it. Even the non-Aboriginal people know it. I don't blame I don't blame them for what's happening now. It's when the first arrival came here. That's where all our trouble started. Well, I like I, I don't know much much about him sailing up the coast. I wish he would have sunk. Uh, my name's Andrew Nye. I was born in Batemans Bay in 1950, and my tribe is uh, Wabunja. But uh, we come under the one umbrella as a Ewing, and I am a cultural commercial fisherman have been for 56 years. My name is Lillian Connell. I'm Andrew's sister. I was born in Batemans Bay back in 1948. So I've got two years on him. 
just stop to think about it. You, um, you're on this land, and it's good land, and they just come in and take it and kill their men, rape their women, and even with the children, they'd bury them in the sand up to their necks and then they'd throw stones at them. So why would I want to be interested in somebody like that? And nothing was done. But you let an Aboriginal man injure a white man back then or kill a white man back then, they got hunted down. But they don't only just get that one person, they practically just about wipe out a village. A, a, a community, you may as well say, because one man got, white man got killed. So with Captain Cook, I'm glad he's not around now. He could only see what he could see from the boat. And uh, one landscape that jumped out at him was, uh, was Gulliga, was Gulliga Mountain. And it's a twin peaked mountain. It was very sacred to our Ewan people and it's very significant for our women. He saw it and it, it reminded him of the, the two humps of a camel. And so he named that mountain Mount Dromedary. But it already had a, a special name. It already had a very special significance to our people. There was early breakdowns as well in our knowledge, our law systems, and also in the ceremony. It's also, been suggested um, that some of those were deliberate as part of uh, making it difficult by changing landscape names and places for First Nations people to be able to maintain those connections. To have your language banned, to have your identity told you can't practice anything, and to be rounded up, to be, to be placed on missions and reserves and to be controlled as a people in a concentration camp style. It's, it's a big part of the reason why Aboriginal people today are experiencing such disproportion in the justice system. Uh, the intergenerational trauma that that has perpetuated has, has left a, a very sad legacy on Aboriginal people. One of the challenges that I think um, we've had in our community for a very long time, and I see this as a direct result of colonisation, is lateral violence. And I think it's time for our community to stand up and call it out for what it is. Um, and it's a violence that is perpetrated from, um, by us as Aboriginal people against other Aboriginal people. Uh, I see in the Aboriginal community that there's a lot of, um, you know, competitive, competitiveness and a lot of um, uh, jealousies of people having more knowledge than others and Whenever one quarry gets one step higher than the rest, there's 20 there to pull them back down. So we are our own worst enemies. Instead of fighting with each other, we should be fighting to keep, capture and record what is ours. And I think the only way we can do that is to not take notice of all this stuff that's going on out here. We need to just do what we need to do and I think that people will follow your example. You know, this, this pelican travelling up, it's done a lot of damage and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of trauma caused um, within our people. But I think about what if that pelican didn't come up the east coast of Australia? What, 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 would, be, what would we be like, you know? What, who, who would we be? There was quite a lot done to try and wipe out that Aboriginal people were here, but they were a resilient mob. They're not going to get rid of us that easy. Locally, on the Yuan Nation, we have a number of people that are helping revitalisation of our language. 
um, some of our cultural practices. We have community who still practice ceremony here on the south coast. We have some of our young men that go through those different levels with people who have that instruction. I've grown up as an Aboriginal man. I always knew I was an Aboriginal man, but I had to live in Western world. Um, so the challenge of being within those two worlds was, was like, who am I? Who, who, who am I as an Indigenous person? But also, how do I fit inside this Western system as well? And so that, that, that identity struggle and, and, and tug of war was, um, was a huge struggle for myself, but also I've seen in a lot of my mob, you know, they, they struggled with the sense of who they are and, you know, it did lead to, um, you know, drug and alcohol abuse and, and stuff like that. And not until I actually, you know, two years ago, I, I, I started dancing and started singing that I felt that, that full connection to culture. You know, some people look at these, these dances and songs as a mimicking of, of animals, and that's all it is. It's not just a mimicking of animals. These animals have, have meaning and have purpose, and these dances have meaning and have purpose and tell you a story. A lot, of, a lot of the stuff that we do, like painting up and go out dancing and stuff, we connect back to, back to the land, back to the country. Um, we, we do a lot of the animals, dances, like if we're doing a bujan or buru, the kangaroo, um, we connect to their spirit. And that's how, when, once we connect with their spirit, it connects us back to country and back to land. Through my personal experience, I've actually hit rock bottom. So believing in my culture brought me out of all that negativity and depressions that I was in. When I turned to dance, it made me feel like I was stronger in knowing who you are and that where you're from and you could overcome anything and nothing's gonna hurt you. As an Aboriginal mother, it's very important for me to bring my daughters out on country. Um, I'm constantly teaching my daughters about the plants, the animals, walking them around, showing them some of the sights. More importantly, one that I'm really passionate about and I've been involved with since 2012 has been the remaking of the possum skin cloaks on the south coast because this was our traditional form of clothing to keep us warm in such a cold climate. Cloaks are very highly significant in that they were gifted from birth. They grew with you throughout your lifetime and they actually follow you through right through to ceremony and going to the grave. You can't teach culture without teaching language. You can't teach language without teaching culture. They go hand in hand. Wallumbura. Wallumbura. Corpus. Corpus. Dolphin. 
Dawari. Dawari. There was only really my grandmother that spoke fluent Duraga. And of course, because they weren't allowed to teach it, and because it, not everybody knew it, they could barely have a fluent conversation with anybody. So I guess growing up, we learnt words, lots of words. And for a long time, I just used to think that they were made up words. But we all used them, the whole family used them. So whilst we didn't have a fluent language that we could speak, we certainly used the words in our everyday conversation. Language means so much to me. When, when I speak language, I feel I'm connecting back with our ancestors. It's a part of my identity as an Aboriginal man. It's, it's a, 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 a lost language. Some people would call it a lost language, but, but I want to be a part of bringing that back because I know what it can do for our people. When we first started putting the dictionary together, I think we only had about 30 words. Over the years, it's taken about 20 years, but now with the dictionary published and out there and everybody buying it, we have 726 words. So ideally, I would like us to be able to teach as many Aboriginal people, our Aboriginal people from our country, the language and feel comfortable and confident that they can take it forward from here. And I think that the only way that we're going to see this language and culture go forward is by empowering these young kids. And I think we need to instill in them being proud of who they are. So we are seeing almost a full circle from the beginning of colonisation to where we are today in, in 2020. There's a lot to, to still be done. I guess the one thing for me is the, the Ewan totem is the duck. And the duck is a very resilient animal. There's the saying, water off a duck's back. Since 220 years, we were tried to be taken off our land, annihilated, pushed back. But we're still here. We're still fighting. We haven't gone away. And we're starting to repractice our cultural uh, practices again. The clan groups are refinding their strength. We have the highest proportion of young people that are, that are being born today and, and the community is growing. So we have a bright outlook in, in that respect. The challenge for us elders is to make sure that they are educated in the ways of looking after their country and that the country is there for them in the future. Jump tree to, jump tree to, I was very privileged to have those old people in my life. I'm now in my 60s and for the first time in my life I know who I am and I know who I am in the law and I know where I stand in the law. And that is a really good place to be but it also does charge you with obligations and responsibilities. You know, we, we have a lot of challenges. There's, there's a lot of challenges as, as Indigenous people. Um, but I guess it's about breaking that cycle and, and, and finding culture. Um, a lot of our mob have, have lost culture, but 
Um, you know, I, I thought as a young man, my culture's been lost. I, I've now told myself it hasn't been lost. It's still there. It's just been hidden. It's been, it's been hidden by fear and 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 you know, distrust. And um, but now I feel all these things are growing and they're getting strong. Trust is growing. Um, you know, that we're, we're all coming, starting to come together. But I think one of the things we can be really hopeful for is that we're living in a time where we've been able to keep those stories, those connections to those places alive. And I think the broader community really want to embrace the names, the stories that are connected. And, you know, we're in a very privileged position to be able to not only pass that on to our children and our grandchildren, but to be able to share that with the broader community now. Yeah.